These artifacts look fabulous, but I bet when you got them, they were a little shop-worn. I'm thinking of decades of just plain house dust mm -hmm. in the lodge. So what were they like when you first saw them? Um, actually, well, I wasn't actually here when they first arrived, um, but I, uh, I, I've seen the documentation, and they were, they were dusty for the most part. Um, these were not moldy. Often we would expect to find mold or um, other contaminants on them, but these were just dusty, most of them, so they've had a good vacuum with a soft brush and a, and a vacuum cleaner. I have some old things around my house uh, that I really fear cleaning because sometimes <laughs> they're held together by the dust. Is that a concern? It absolutely is a concern, um, but uh, Conservators have a lot of experience with looking at the material, how strong the material is, how robust the material is, and even though they're far less robust than they used to be when they were new, um, my team here has so much experience with these materials that they can, they can gauge whether it's going to withstand whatever level of treatment. And in this case, a very gentle brushing and vacuuming will reveal what is just surface dust and what is ingrained, and then that's a different level of intervention. L let's start with looking at them. Is mm -hmm. this under a microscope, under spe not a microscope, but a, a magnifying a mirror glass? Is it uh, uh, with uh, mm -hmm. special lights, or in what uh, environment do you look this stuff over? I think you'll go and see the labs tomorrow or maybe Wednesday, and you'll see um, it's just visual inspection with your eyes to start with. We have stereoscopic microscopes as well. Um, and we have magnifying lenses, uh, but for the most part, you just, you just really look closely at it, and you understand the way it was put together. And as I say, my team has so much experience with that. Um, they, they know these, in, these objects. Although each object is different and unique, the technology and the materials are the same. Well, now, I don't, but boy, that both objects look like they're in fantastic yeah. shape. Uh, are you looking for the ratio of dust to original material or cracks in the original material? Or kind of what are you looking for to determine how robust it would be? Um, we look for structural damage first and foremost because we don't want the object to collapse or to do further damage sitting in storage. So if it looks like it's sagging or something is breaking, we'll look for the, we'll look for the cause of that. Is there a structural member that's broken? How can we support that so that it stops it getting worse? Um, so initially, you know, unless it's really filthy, we're not looking at dirt. We're looking at the structural condition. Is this going to fall apart in front of us or is this good to sit here while we do the rest of our analysis, or not analysis, but inspection and assessment of the condition. So it's, it's structural first. We can look past the dust. Now, you say a soft brush. Yes. I always think of archaeologists and preservationists working with toothbrushes, but I bet No, I'm that's wrong. not soft. <laughs> um, what kind of a brush? Is this a pig hide or horse hide? A or sable, what is it? sable brush is very sable. nice. You know, like a watercolor painter would use a very fine, very soft bristle brush. And that's what you want, particularly in something like this where you have to get into the interstices and, and all the little the nooks and crannies. And you don't want to be sticking a big brush or a stiff bristle brush in there. How long would it take to uh, dust off one of these objects? Um, well, the difference between those two is incredible. This is this is a fairly straightforward texture. That one, oh, probably more hours than you would want to spend vacuuming. Well, I, I'm <laughs> uh, well. I'm starting with the brush. I'm not at vacuuming yet, but I, I'm I'm guessing um, a couple of weeks of work um, to, to get into each one of those round. Nooks several and several days, and you would brush with a with a vacuum held uh, away from the surface, not against the surface, because there's no point in just disturbing it, and then having it settle back. So you have to disturb it and sort of brush it towards the vacuum and and take the dust away. Uh, Two-handed operation. Yes. Right. Um, any uh, other guess as to how long, it, let's say, it would take to do that? Okay, three, four, or five days, maybe. And and the occupational hazard is surely sitting all day and a bad back leaning over this well we have had ergonometric evaluations done of conservators working positions for sure and you can get neck pain and you can get mm, headaches from concentrating but you can just get up and stretch and you 
Do any stand? Um, while working? It depends on the object. If it's a tall object and it's, you know, you have to move all around it, then you can't do that from a sitting position. Are there any new colors or new coloring or new materials on either one of these objects? Um, that we have added? Mm -hmm. No. Really? Well then, fantastic shape to begin with, right? Yes, absolutely. Tell me about the, the ethical code in uh, preservation and restoration. Um, how much rebuilding or new material is considered appropriate and then at what point do you say, well gee, I'm, I'm kind of uh, playing around too much with the original object. I'm changing it too much. Well, conservation and restoration are different. Um, conservation plans or aims to do absolutely minimal intervention. So we don't want to change the original material. We don't want to change anything about it. We want to stabilize it, which means stop it from falling apart, stop it from getting worse. Um, science, conservation science has shown us the way things deteriorate, what caused them to deteriorate. So if we can do away with that or reduce that, we call that preventive conservation. So that's step one. Um, and then... And what's that, moisture? That's keeping uh, it keeping it a stable RH so it doesn't go from being damp to dry, which causes the fibers in something like this to expand and contract. Don't want to freeze it. That's, you know, expanding and contracting. Um, temperature. Temperature is very bad for it accelerates all the chemical deterioration. So we keep it at a steady 18 degrees Celsius and 50% RH. That's what all of our storage and museum environment is. Um, and low light because light is also not only causing fading of any dyes, but it will cause a deterioration of the cell structure of any organics, leathers, wood, um, basketry fibers. So we want to, that's, that's preventive conservation. Um, and then, um, hmm, I lost my train of thought now. Well, we were, uh, <laughs> with, with shards uh, mm -hmm. of uh, pottery from the ancient world, uh, and th there would be shards of pottery from uh, uh, indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. There is a tendency to want to put new materials around ah, it yes, to show what the object looked like, because otherwise it's a shard. What is the ethical consideration there? Well, for us, um, in things like this, we would not replace missing elements unless it was for, and, and this is, this is a, an interpretive thing, because the difference between a structural or a stability treatment and an aesthetic treatment is we want it to not get any worse, and so we will look after it, stabilize it so it doesn't get worse. For an aesthetic treatment, somebody may wish it to look like it was just used yesterday. So if we do that sort of a treatment, we want to, we use modern materials. We don't try and fake it with traditional materials. So we use modern materials which we will disguise so that they don't detract from it but they also are very obvious if you look closely. So that's what I was talking to you earlier about the totem poles. The totem pole bases are new because the bottom's rotted out of them. You can see that they're new, but you don't immediately think, uh, that's a new part. It's, it's there, it's obvious when you look closely, but it doesn't try and fake anything. Why not old original materials? Because if we lose the documentation, where we've said that we've replaced this part, at some point in the future somebody might think it was original, and we don't ever want that to happen. We want the original as we received it to be the final. So you'd use a different type of wood, a different type of grass to signal to the future um, this was this, fixed up at one this point, was a replacement. but don't yeah. misunderstand mm -hmm. that this is mm -hmm. the, these were the materials used. Yeah. And, and at times if it becomes a question of if we're going to adhere a support, or tie it on, we would prefer to tie it on because every time you add an adhesive or a coating or a consolidant, you're changing the original material, which we try to avoid. Now, my um, determined mind looks at that and says, boy, to me, that represents a real sophisticated society and a division of labor. While someone is doing that dozens and dozens of hours of work, someone else has to be trading or hunting or fishing or cooking or building the domicile, or looking after the domicile. Do you have a comment? I mean, does that, do these objects speak to you in that way? Um, not me personally. No, me personally, I, as a conservator, um, they are beautiful objects, but I look at them from a materials and a construction and a preservation point of view. 
It's not my job to interpret them. Sorry, I touched <laughs> it's, it's my job to make sure that they're here in 100 years, 200 years for other people to enjoy. Interesting.